Hello, I'm your host, Chris Roberts. Welcome to The Long Show. <clears throat> Excuse me. I hope you enjoyed last week's show with um, my grandkids. And i um, pretty proud of those guys and the other grandchildren that are not here. Um, <clears throat> they were pretty open when they talked about um, education and what they expected to um, get from education. They were a little bit, um, they had higher expectations for themselves than some of the people around this community thinks with, with children. Um, they talked about the importance of the arts and physical education and music. And so just that was just food for thought. And after the show, they made me go home and make um, a classroom in my house. So I had to go get some tables and desks and chalkboard because they want to learn more. And um, so in the little video clip that I have later on will be some of the things that most of us, our children, never get the opportunity to see. So now we're going to go on to um, the shenanigans up in um, Concord, some of the things that are going on. One is a bill to limit education, I mean, limit evolution teaching up in, in New Hampshire schools. Um, a 10-year-old Jack and Hinkle, uh, Nashua spoke about um, his thoughts about teaching evolution in public schools in the state as a theory. And, well, evolution is a theory. It's an evolving theory. And a theory is something that is not completely factual. It hasn't been proven. This isn't a law of evolution. It's a theory of evolution. A law, <clears throat> you could go, people talk about the Paragonian th theory, which I'm pronouncing wrong, you know, the right triangle, <clears throat> basically the base times the height squared equals the, um, the angle side, the longest side, three, two, three, four triangle. You know what, that's, that can be proven, and that's taught that way. Evolution is a theory, and it's taught as, evolu as a theory. And even now, if you go to some magazines like the um, National Geographic, I think last year they had some uh, a good article challenging some of the things about evolution, but it's not, evolution has, has not been disproven, so it remains a theory. And so we have to go and say, why is a 10-year-old, is this 10-year-old child um, speaking what he, out of his own mind, or he's speaking what his parents are, are telling him. And um, one of the other guys, that he goes, political, a theory including theorists, political and ideological viewpoints and their position on the concept of atheism. The sponsors said organizations like Planned Parenthood and ACLU are the part of, of the culture of death in the United States. He said, thought that, <clears throat> he says, thought the lies of evolution taught in public schools, the system has achieved aristocracy. <clears throat> no, we don't have a king. We don't have um, a royal um, ruling body. And American Civil Liberties Union, sometimes I think they go too far. But they have defended um, quite a few people who would have never had the opportunity to, um, to have their day in court. And so, again, just like the theory of evolution at the American Civil Liberties Union, <clears throat> some people like it, some people don't. A lot of people in the middle, you can't prove that American Civil, American Civil Liberties Union is responsible, responsible for the culture of death in the United States. I don't even think we have the culture of death. I know we don't have a culture of death in the United States. And you can't go with someone else and say the American Civil Liberty Union is a communist organization. There's a lot of really well-intended people in American Civil ACLU that do a great job. Again, the other thing in, in Concord, we have a 10-year road plan. And right now, the 10-year road plan for the state of New Hampshire is only short $1.5 billion. And, <clears throat> yep, the, the next 10-year highway plan is more than $1.5 billion short of revenue to meet the needs. And so Nashua, $4.7 million reconstruction of Route 130. 
$2.2 million rebuilt of Main Street from Hollis to Orchard Avenue, $5.3 million widening of Route 101A, 101A, all necessary projects that didn't make the cut from 2013 to 2022. So basically right now, at the earliest that the people could even hope they can get these required projects was be in 2023. The $250 million plan to bring commuter rail service from Boston through Nashville and Concord isn't paid for. You know, I would have a, a lot of question whether to, that it would be a worthwhile expense. $250 million. Nashville and Concord, they're average size cities, but I don't know if they can support um, a rail line. Neither is the $15 million cost to buy the passenger cars that would carry the consumers. <clears throat> They don't have the $360 million cost to widen Interstate 93 from Exit 3 in Wimbledon to Manchester. Why? When the Republicans took charge, one of the first things they wanted to do was, and did, was repeal the $30 surcharge on auto registration. Well, as a result, that, that $30 was put in to pay for a lot of these projects. <clears throat> the repeal of the $30 surcharge of fair deep cut in federal grants and no increase in the state gasoline tax in 21 years. Again, we don't want to raise taxes, even the Democrats, when the Democrats were in control, um, Representative Campbell had been on the um, Transportation Committee, brought up and says, we need to fund these projects, we need to have money. And there was a proposal of a 15 cent increase over three years, five years over um, <clears throat> three years, that was voted down. And so what has the, the Republicans last year I spoke against and we got shot down, uh, we were able to shot down was <clears throat> the um, Speaker O'Brien wanted to re reduce gas tax by a nickel. You know, that would have done the same thing as the cigarette tax. And what have they done right now? They have came up with a proposal to reduce the gas tax, to eliminate the gas tax, gas tax window for Memorial Day weekend hoping to get people to come up to New Hampshire. Well, you know what? <clears throat> if, the, if the state was going to reduce the gas tax um, by 15 cents a gallon, <clears throat> and I'm a um, gas station or owner, guess what? I'm going to get 15 cents more per gallon in my pocket because I'm not going out and reducing the, um, my prices by 15 cents. It just isn't going to happen. People are going to come up. They're going to have to buy gas. And I'm going to do the same thing the cigarette companies did. Once the state of New Hampshire dropped its cigarette tax by 10 cents, I jacked mine up by 10 cents. So I make 10 cents profit on every pack of cigarettes made, additional profit, and the state of New Hampshire loses 10 cents on each uh, pocket. <clears throat> Another thing that <clears throat> we all know about and um, very few people really want to talk about is the burden growing on local taxpayers. It started with the Democrats winning control and to help balance the budget. They cut out a lot of stuff, a lot of state support, state support to the retirement fund, and it's continued under the Democratic, I mean the Republican leadership. And so, you know, both sides are to blame. <clears throat> and according to a lot of things, <clears throat> the New Hampshire Public Policy Institute financing New Hampshire cities and towns in the 2012 update for in 2002, the local property tax accounted for 56 percent of all spending. Right now, the local property taxing basically accounts for 61 percent of all spending. So in the past um, nine years, the state of New Hampshire has downshifted 5 percent of the total um, property tax, the tax burden onto the local property owners. And <clears throat> We can go and say, well, it's a result of um, growth, <coughs> me. but a lot of communities have been laying off people. The, and um, for example, I think the city of Keene, we have 34 to 37 positions that once people quit or retired, we left vacant. So to say that the city of Keene is bigger than it was a couple years ago would be false. Let, <coughs> And it's, it's happening all around the state. Lynchfield and Merrimack. Each community found it necessary to eliminate more than 20 school positions last year. 
in the bid to keep tax um, stable. Merrimack also, besides the 20 t school positions, Merrimack also act two firefighter positions. It's, um, they're working on getting rid of some police positions because they just can't afford it. And so downshifting is happening no matter what they want to say, downshifting is happening. And for example, compared to 2001, the, um, the gross appropriation for municipalities, schools, and county services <coughs> by the local taxpayer was $2,660 per person. In 2010, it's $3,840 per person. <coughs> That's not a household. So for example, a homeowner with two, your share would be about $7,700. Um, That's what that would cost. And the per, 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 per capita state aid to schools in 2007 was $715 per person. In 2011, it's 712. So it's going down. It's going down three years, despite the fact that school costs have been going up. The municipality, the state used to give the municipality in 2703. Now it's down to $89. People could say, well, you know, school is only down $3 and um, the state is eight to the towns and cities is down $14. And over four years, you'd say that's not much. Well, it is much because as the costs over the four years have continued to rise, more and more of that is being, um, has to be borne by the, um, the local taxpayers. Another big shenanigan that's going on in um, the state house is the attempt to do away with uh, mandatory um, contraception um, devices and medication. New Hampshire is one of the 28 states that offer universal coverage for all contraceptive devices. Um, <clears throat> Speaker O'Brien, other ones are um, trying to get rid of it. And um, <clears throat> he said that basically, when Speaker O'Brien said Monday that the Obama administration mandate on contraception was a horrible overreach despite a similar mandate in state law that offers universal coverage on all contraceptive de um, devices. O'Brien confirmed he's open to legislation that would repeal New Hampshire's contraceptive um, language. And his reply was, we didn't know it was there, we don't want it there. And so basically what they're going to try to do is get rid of the, to the requirement for businesses, schools, everything to say, hey, if they don't want to provide um, contraceptive coverage, they don't have to provide contraceptive um, coverage. Um, main, you know, when you look at something, when someone goes and says, does something, you ask, what's the benefit of it? What are they going to do about it? Why are they doing it? To me, this, this whole thing that came out from the federal government concerning um, contraceptives, to me, I think it was a, a political game. <clears throat> and from a political standpoint, it works, um, it works perf perfectly. Because you look at it this way. What was happening at the same time this, this mandate from the federal level came out? At the same time this mandate from the federal level came out, the president did two things. One was to ask Congress to increase the, the debt limit by $1.2 trillion. And it's like, oops, that was overlooked. At the same time, he came out with a budget that was going to be 1.3, had a $1.3 trillion deficit. You, <clears throat> the other report came out that you, the number of workers in the United States has dropped off drastically while unemployment number is going down, the amount of workers in the United States is dropping off. It's not 160 million like we're talking about, it's down to 140 and could very easily go below 140 million dollars, 140 million people. So you ask for a debt increase of 1.2, you have a budget that's 1.3 trillion, and, and then workforce participation is going down. All politically, all three of those are really serious problems. 
<clears throat> so you come out with this mandate, which you quickly change, which you knew you could have done right in the beginning. Hawaii, that you could have used the Hawaii method, but no, not only did um, <clears throat> it cover up this, the Republicans, Santorum, Romney, O'Brien, all of a sudden, everybody is jumping on contraceptive. <clears throat> Are the insurance companies going to stop giving contraceptives? You know, wait a minute. Now, just think from the insurance company's point of view. One, do I want to pay for the delivery and the well care of a child? That may cost me three to five thousand dollars. And contraceptives, what are they going to cost me? The insurance companies are not in the business of making us happy. They're in the business of making money. So the great majority of the Americans have no problem with the way the contraceptive system works right now. The insurance companies have no problem with how it works now. Basically, it was a political game, and the Republicans jumped on it. Look at the last two weeks in the Republican primary. All they've been talking about is contraceptive, contraceptive, overreach, violation of church and state, all that. And guess what? They, no one is talking about the issues. No one is talking about putting the American people back to work in meaningful and well-paying jobs. The other big thing up in Concord, <clears throat> is marriage equality. They are fighting over and over again to do away with marriage equality. New Hampshire was the first state to have um, marriage equality without being forced by the courts. New Hampshire <coughs> made sure that um, we separated civil marriage and religious marriage. No church has to marry anybody, but a lot of churches do marry people. They they support loving committing couples, um, <clears throat> and, it, and it's been going. And we've given some protection to the church and the fraternal organization so they can't be sued and be forced to perform something that's against their dogma. They, can't, they don't have to worry about losing their tax-exempt status, and so it was fair. People, if they wanted, could go in and get a civil marriage, justice of the peace or whatever, and then necessary, if they wanted to get a religious marriage, they could get both. Or if they wanted to get a religious marriage, they were still covered. All marriages would be treated the same, same protection, equal protection in the state of New Hampshire. <coughs> and so, and right now, <coughs> also the state of New Hampshire would recognize a legally consummated marriage, and that's not probably not the right word, but the, any legal marriage that was done in other parts of the, <coughs> the country. And in the past two years, um, since New Hampshire um, had passed its marriage equality law, there's 1,887 same-sex marriages. And so far, the world hasn't fallen apart. And so <coughs> it's hard to see what the problem is. You know, New Hampshire talks about being an independent state. We got our independent Yankee spirit. Well, <clears throat> I think the New Hampshire's independent Yankee spirit is up for sale. According to the Sunday's um, union leader, this too big. New, ha New York City uh, Mayor Michael Bloomberg recently gave $50,000 to stand up for New Hampshire families in um, <clears throat> a Concord group that backs gay marriage. The National Organization for Marriage, NOM, plans to tap a nationwide donor base to spend $250,000 on TV commercials and to donate to candidates who pose gay marriage. Um, here in Keene, if you listen to some of the radio stations, you've already heard competing um, commercials concerning same-sex marriage, civil union, gay marriage. To me, I view marriage as marriage equality. I don't talk about gay marriage, lesbian marriage. It's marriage equality. Two consenting adults, you know, <clears throat> not brother and sister and stuff, but if two consenting adults want to get together in a loving commitment, that's, to me, it's not my um, right to judge. It's not the state's right to ask why, why they want to get married. The state doesn't ask two heterosexuals why they, they want to get married. 
heterosexuals get married for all kinds of reasons. Some financial, some um, loving commitment. There's all many, there's so many um, reasons why they do. And the um, new NOM president, Brian Brown, says New Hampshire is in the spotlight. I think the legislature has a chance to right the tremendous wrong of forcing this thing through a few years ago. Asking what the $250,000 would do, Brown said, we will expose those candidates who decide to undermine marriage. Planning crew includes running independent TV ads as well donating directly to legislators' campaigns this year. <clears throat> and so, and for example, in 2010, OM, NOM spent more than $1 million, including running ads critical of Republican gubernatorial candidate Bill Binney because he refused to speak up against same-sex marriage. And so we look at it, basically, New Hampshire, a small city, a city state of one million, a little bit more than a million people. We have an outside organization that spent a million dollars in 2010 in hopes of changing the outcome of our senator election. Now they want to come in and spend $250,000 on commercials and to donate <coughs> to find candidates and donate money to their campaigns to run against other re Republicans and, um, <coughs> and up, especially Republicans that don't support them. Wait a minute. You're talking about a legislator that gets $100 a year and an outside organization is coming in with their money to go in and pick candidates. I think if you look at the 400 um, representatives, if people spend more than a few hundred dollars to get a, for signs and stuff, it's quite surprising. But now, basically, this, this org outside organization wants to come in <coughs> and determine who should be elected into our um, into the state house. So <clears throat> right now the state house in New Hampshire is no longer, the, in my opinion, is no longer the people's house. In a lot of cases it's the individual house. We have people up there, we have one individual who's filed 51 bills. We have individuals who are up there and they feel that their way is the only way. They, they're the only ones who have the right to judge what the people in New Hampshire should be having, what they should be thinking, and what their moral and ethical standard should be. So a lot of people are going to the state house and feel it's their house, their ability to do what should happen. <clears throat> no, um, the other one is change vowed to bill in bill to repeal. <clears throat> it's um, Representative Dave Bates. <clears throat> Part of what in his initial bill, one is to remove the religious clause. He's saying if that is what it takes to pass it. In his bill, would define marriage as the legally rep recognized union of one man and one woman. It would allow ci civil unions defined as contractual agreements that provide reciprocal benefits and obligations to the party to the agreement, and it would entitle those parties to all right and obligation. I, obligations and responsibilities. So basically, he, what he wants to do is same-sex couples, basically they would go into basically a legal partnership. You know, it's kind of like two lawyers or two um, doctors getting together and saying this is brown and brown um, partnership. <clears throat> Part of what he has, the liberty, religious liberty section of the bill, which would bar penalizing any individual, corporation, entity, association, education, institution, or society for refusing to sodomize, solemnize, or treat as valid at any civil union if it violates their sincere, held, religious, or moral beliefs. Well, the first thing is their sincere, held, held religious, or moral beliefs. Who's the judge of that? And so, <clears throat> if my sincere moral um, and religious and moral beliefs are like it was 200, 200 years ago and says 
all blacks are not real people. They're not really human. They're only three fifths of a person and they don't deserve these rights. And I don't have to do this. That's my sincere religious beliefs. Do we want New Hampshire to go that way? My severe, severe religious beliefs. Well, <clears throat> my mother and father, I'm a biracial child. <clears throat> I'm not a child anymore, but my grandchildren are biracial. But there are people whose religious beliefs think that we are <clears throat> against God's law. It was immoral for my mother and father to get together. And up until recently, not too long ago, Virginia and other ones, it was on the books that said it was a law. So when I was born, <clears throat> I won't tell you when, but it was a long time ago, I was born illegally because I was, my mother and father had broke the law by conceiving me. <clears throat> we don't want that back in New Hampshire. And the other one is their civil union. So if I go get a civil union in New Hampshire and you don't like it, you don't have to recognize it. Said, so, sorry, you know what? As far as I'm concerned, you don't have a civil union. It's done. But the law says I have a civil union. Nope, but this law says I can disregard that law. Wait a minute. We don't need to produce laws in New Hampshire, which gives other people the right to dis disregard. <clears throat> It says, be not be compelled to participate in same-sex marriage ceremony. There should be similar things protecting people from being compelled to participate in a civil union. <clears throat> a civil union is, a, okay, participate in a civil union? That's the justice of the peace. That's going down to city hall. That's a judge. So if I go to to <clears throat> the judge and say, I want to get married in a civil union, the judge who's a ward of the court, who works for the state, a justice of the peace who is given <clears throat> that authority by the state can say, sorry, buddy, I don't want that. It just ain't going to happen. You go find some other judge or you find some other justice of the peace. Wait a minute. Do we want judges on the court that would go and say, these are my sincere religious beliefs. And so because you are violating my sincere religious beliefs, I have to judge you guilty. I have to give you a greater penalty. No, our judge is supposed to be impartial. They're supposed to follow the laws. They don't have the right to change the laws to their beliefs. Let's get a little bright here in the, in the light. And um, let's see how we put it. And he also says in the bill, children can only be conceived naturally through compel copulation by two heterosexual couples. Because of this biological reality, New Hampshire has unique, distinct, unique, distinct and compelling interest in promoting stable and committed marriage units through op opposite sex couples as so to increase the likelihood that children be born to and raised by both of their national, natural parents. Okay, wait a minute. So if you can't conceive children in New Hampshire, that means what? You're going to be in violation of the law if you go have <clears throat> other ways, um, infertile, if you're infertile or fertilized ways to have eggs implant or surrogate mothers, you're violating, you'll be violating New Hampshire law because you and your husband or your husband and wife would have had to conceal the child yourself. You know, that's almost like going back to um, thoroughbred horses. No artificial insemination, no nothing. You have to conceive by copulation to be a thoroughbred. We're humans, we're not um, horses. The other part is, <clears throat> well, not everybody that gets married gets married for the right reason, and not everybody who gets married should stay married. Not everyone who has children make great parents. If you've got two children, you've got a child, and one, is, and one of the adults is an alcoholic, the other one's abusive, how in the world is that going to benefit the, the child? To me, I see no way in the world that it should benefit that child. <clears throat> And the other part is people don't study their history. 
the, the number of divorces in the United States started going up <clears throat> in the 1920s and they increased drastically in the 1940s, then higher in the 1950s, then higher in the 1970s. Well, and people go, well, yep, that's because they're not in loving, committing um, relation, um, relationships. But you know what? If you come from a social science angle, you come from sociology angle, okay, what is the common denominator in those four periods of where divorce has increased? I'll tell you what the common denominator is. It's World War I, where you had the battles of Somme and Verdun, where a million people, million casualties in less than six weeks. World War II, you had Ir <clears throat> Iwo Jima, you had the concentration camps, you had um, Okinawa, then World War, and next one is Korea. Plain and simple, chosen reservoir, over 50,000 Americans killed. Then you had, in 1970s, you had Vietnam. <clears throat> okay, and what was common about those? There were brutal wars, there was a lot of deaths, and people came back and they started questioning authority. They started questioning their religion. Some of them would say, hey, wait a minute. What we saw in war is what you see in war, the horrors of war, moral and ethical. No, sometimes it was just brutal survival. People came back and started questioning their religion. <clears throat> and they would say, why did God let all this happen? Why did 50 million people get killed in World War II? Why did tens of millions of people get killed in World War I? Why did so many people get killed in Korea and so many more killed in Vietnam? <clears throat> I'm not making a judgment on any religion. I'm not making a judgment on anyone's God or definition of God. <clears throat> but when young men and women go off to war and they see the horrors of war and they come back they question their future, they question their lives, they question their society, they question their government, they question their religion. <clears throat> and so when you look back, the increases in divorce are getting more and more, happened right after major wars, okay? And so that was, to me, really one of the, the serious problems. So. Doing away with contraceptives is not going to bring marriages back because when people look at marriages, most time people got married for economic reasons and women stayed in horrible marriages because they couldn't leave, they couldn't afford to leave, they couldn't afford to take their children. Women are better educated now, they get more jobs, there are more women in college than there are men, and so if it's a horrible, brutal marriage, a woman now can leave that marriage and be, be comfortable that she can support her children and give a better future to her children. So we have this myth, and people like Mr. Bates and Mr. O'Brien want to go back to something in a lot of ways never really exist. So, that's what's happening up in um, <clears throat> Concord. And so what we're going to do now is um, <clears throat> I spent some time in the Massachusetts Museum of Art. And if I make my trip around the, the country this year, yeah, I'm going to pick up some more lighthouses. But my goal is to stop at as many of the museums as possible. A quality education, when you go into Mass Museum of Art, there's some children there but they're children of higher income people. These children are learning stuff and they're getting uh, education that um, the average child would not get. I go in, I take these pictures, I sit down with my grandkids and they love it, they wanna go, their eyes are, are wide open. And so we'll give you a short six minute, um, about a six minute clip of the, some of the artifacts of ancient uh, Middle East art. And then we'll come back and we'll put some truth behind the rising gas prices. So I hope you jo enjoy the, um, the clip.
Well, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed it. I was there. I was in awe, and I only spent a couple hours there. I've got um, <clears throat> a bunch of other ones, Renaissance art and stuff, and hopefully if it doesn't snow Wednesday, since I don't have to go to Concord, I'm going to try to get down to Boston and spend the whole day in the, um, the museum and um, try to go some of the other ones. My goal is to also bring the, my grandkids down there, and I miss that. When I was a kid and I was talking to Ernie, <clears throat> how we used to have school field trips get to go to the um, museums. That doesn't happen anymore, and so kids in Keene and the other small communities, they just miss out. <clears throat> you can't do that. You know, kids in Boston, some can go, but like I said, most of them were um, upper income kids who were going to go to top notch colleges. They were getting an education by being in the museum. And um, to me, it was in a couple of hours, a lot of times you can get more education in the museum than you'll get in that couple of days during your school year. Okay, <clears throat> talk about gas prices, talk about oil. And um, the reason why, and hopefully by the time I'm done with this, you'll be able to ask questions and you'll learn how we're being snooked by both sides. Um, I think it was about four or five weeks ago when I said that um, when um, we get the tax holiday, um, the price of gas seems to go up. Well, one of the reasons was last time we had the federal government had to borrow $180 billion to cover the cost of the tax holiday to put into Social Security. Again, the government's going to have to borrow about $180 billion to put into um, Social Security. So. Again, you know, who's going to buy those bonds? Where's the money coming from? Does the Federal Reserve print more money to um, cover that cost? Or does China or Saudi Arabia or one of the other ones come up? And right here in the New York Times, a year ago, shortly after he won an extension of the payroll tax cut from Congress, oil prices began rising, effectively taking away some of the economic benefit from the extension. In recent weeks, the pattern has repeated itself. It goes, the recent rise in oil prices stem largely from Iran's threat to disrupt the global oil trade and from the fears that Israel may attack Iran to disrupt its nuclear program. The price of barrel of domestic oil was $106 on Wednesdays, up from a recent low of $75 in early October. Well, right now, when I left this morning, it was $109 a gallon. And so, again, is it really um, Iran's fault? And so what I did was, here it is, if you make $12, $15, or $20 an hour. Based on those, these are your wages. And at the 2%, <clears throat> if you make $12, you're going to get $499 back, $625 for 15 And if you make 20 bucks an hour, you're going to get $932 back. This is based on... 2,080 hours, basically working 40 hours, 52 weeks. Well, <clears throat> basically, since um, December, the price of gas has gone up 73 cents. And so what I did was, say you have 12, um, drive 12,000 miles a year. And basically what I did was an average of 18 uh, miles per gallon, miles per gallon, based, that's a combined. So... As a result of the 53 cent increase, if you work, if you drive 12,000 miles and compare, so you're going to get $145. That's all you're going to get out of this. But if you drive 18,000 miles, which is average, the average car is 15 to 18,000 um, miles a year, and so it's going to cost you, you're going to use about 1,000 gallons. So if you make 12 bucks an hour and you drive 18,000 um, <clears throat> miles this year, you are going to be down $31. You are not going to get any benefit whatsoever from the payroll um, holiday. It's all going right into your gas tank. At $15 an hour, at $18,000, 18, all you're going to do is make $94. $20 an hour, you get $402. But if you drive 24,000 um, miles, in Keene, you know, maybe you have two cars at 12000 each or one twenty um, 24000 Some people in Keene drive down, 
the Nashua or Manchester, Concord. Some go down to Boston. So at 12 bucks an hour, 24,000 uh, miles, you're short $207. At 15, you're short 82. At the $20, you're gonna get 226 to the plus. Okay, but even in a perfect world, the 499, you get, at 12 bucks an hour, you get $2.78 a week extra to spend. You can't even buy a Starbucks coffee for that. At $15, you get $502 to spend. You can't even buy a McDonald's um, meal for that. If you're making 20, yep, you get $11.13. So that's your best. In the, <clears throat> but if you're driving 12,000 miles, but if you're driving 24,000 miles, 12 bucks an hour, you lose four dollars a week. Fifteen dollars an hour, you lose a um, buck fifty a week. And twenty, you make four dollars and thirty-four cents extra a week. So again, what are you going to get for four dollars and thirty-four cents? I think a Big Mac and a quarter pounder and cheese is like three ninety-nine, and so thirty-six. So that's four dollars and thirty-five cents with tax. Big Mac or um, quarter pounder with cheese, that's what you're gonna get. You have to come up with another penny to buy one of those a week. Right now, gas is 371 in Keene, Concord 389, Boston 403, California is 505, and one of the other places like Santa Monica, premium is $5.55. So something is serious wrong here. Okay, in 2011, the United States produced more crude oil than 2008, the first <clears throat> increase in over 25 years. For the first time since 1949, the United States is importing more oil-based fuels than it imports. That's right. The United States is selling jet fuel, heating oil, gasoline, and diesel overseas. Why? Because it's a global uh, market and they can send it where they get the most. Again, 50% of the United States petroleum imports come from the Western Hemisphere. 25% of all oil comes from Canada. Okay, when we talk about Saudi Arabia, only 12% of the United States oil comes from Saudi Arabia. That's compared to 19% in 1993. <clears throat> Why? Brazil is producing more um, Oil, it's got new oil, offshore oil. North Dakota has gone from 100,000 barrels in 2005 to a half a million in 2011. Montana and Texas are producing more gas. The Canadian tar sands produced 1.1 million barrels in uh, 2005. In 2015, it's going to produce 3.2. Here's the thing, China's oil consumption grew by 7.5% per year. China gets 58% of its oil from the Middle East right now. By 2015, China will get 70% of its oil from the Middle East. Why is the price of oil going up? China in 2006 used 5 million barrels. 2011, 9 million barrels. 2015, it will use 15 million barrels. A 6 million barrel per day increase between 2011 and 2015. India in 2011, 4 million in 2015, seven million. So India and China will use nine million more barrels per day <clears throat> by 2015. Just think of it, nine million barrels a day. That's what the United States uh, produces. Where is that oil coming from? It's coming on the open market. And um, <clears throat> basically, when you go in and look at our, the oil imports, we got pretty close to 18 million barrels a day. Only three come from the Gulf states. Saudi Arabia round off to 1.5 million, Iraq 400,000, and Kuwait 145. Those are the, of the top 15. And <clears throat> so when we're talking about Iraq, I mean Iran, Iran has very little effect on us. Plain and simple, because Mexico and Canada produces over 4 million um, barrels a day. South America sells us 2.2 million barrels a day. Africa, Nigeria, Angola, and, um, <clears throat> and Nigeria, Angola, and Algeria, 1.2 million. And we even buy 600 million from Russia. So, <clears throat> again, plain and simple, it's the world market. 
here in the United States. We're selling more oil and heating oil and diesel overseas because you can get a better price. And so it doesn't really matter how much oil that we produce in the United States. It goes to who's going to give the highest price. And the biggest demand right now is China. And so if China is willing to pay more for gas and diesel, heating oil than what we are, that's where it's going to go. And we're, we're competing against China and India. So hopefully I'll see you on the long road. Probably I'll see you walking more than you would like. But then again, hopefully we don't have $5 oil because all it's going to do is take a few hurricanes this year and then we're going to be in trouble. So again, take care and I'll see you out there and have a good day.